everything that you could ever need to know about the show. It's in the show notes. Everything that you could ever need to know about the show. It's in the show notes. So go on over to Grimerica.ca or Grimerica.com. See what you can find. See what you can find. See what you can find. Everything that you could ever need to know. It's in the show notes. Everything that you could ever need to know about this particular show. It's in the show notes. Show notes. Show notes. Show notes. Show notes. Show notes. It gets really, really deep and complicated when when you start really digging into the supercharged ionosphere and the space fence technology. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Grime America Show. Uh, we're going to be chatting with Mr. Matt Landman a little bit later about... Uh, Finally, a little bit of chemtrails and some Frankenskies and all sorts of fun stuff like that. Uh, so it's a fun one. It's good or you guys should enjoy that. Uh, so, of course, without further ado, the one and only all in believer in chemtrails himself, Mr. Graham Dunlaw. Not all in, but close. The jingles don't lie, bro. That's right. How you been? You're not in uh. studio. Frustrated Not in studio with... and a little frustrated with audio problems, to be honest. I'll try and get over that. Try and plow through it, power through it. You think it matters if you put the postage on the wrong corner of an envelope? Yeah, it might. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Felix, he'll never get his <laughs> magnets. I'm more concerned about wasting the stamps now. I think, Fuck. Here, here, here's a tip for all the listeners. If you want some swag, probably go to grimerica.ca slash swag instead of like emailing Darren to, to mail you something physically. You can't get the magnets though. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. So I've put the postage in the top left corner. That'll work. Yeah. I'll throw the return address in the top right. Yeah, so this is a good episode. I've been wanting to talk to to Matt about about uh, weather modification. I mean, he really gets into the history of that, and that's why that's why I, I don't say I'm an all in believer because something's going on for sure. But to what level, I don't know. You know, is it is it one of these things where they're using um certain spraying for different things? Probably. You know, maybe there's different motives. But something's definitely going on. Yeah, seems to be. Seems to be. I mean, I'm still not sure about that, but... Uh, about what? About what exactly it is. Um, or how sinister it might be, but, I mean, people are definitely spraying shit in all sorts of different capacities. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Huh. That's a good, well, yeah. I seen a plane today, actually, with some persistent contrail action. Yeah, hey, what'd you think about? Well, maybe that's a chemtrail, but he wasn't even in the direction of the sun. What does that have to do with anything? Well, what's he doing, then, if it's not for the sun, what's it for? It was rather low, too. What do you mean the direction of the sun? The sun is everywhere in the day. Not to the north of me. Never to the north of me, not for another fucking six months. Uh, you, you, it still makes it there. What does? The sun does? But yeah. The sun is never even gets directly above us for the next six it months. It doesn't matter. Right it's still shining. Sky. Shining what? If anything, it's going to shine off that chemtrail and be extra sunny in Calgary. <laughs> Are we trying to hide global cooling? Yeah, maybe, eh? Maybe that's it. It's getting hotter at the equator and colder in Calgary. So that's why the chemtrails are always, like, not blocking the sun. We're actually trying to reflect more sun. 
What do you think? Yeah, but they're blocking the sun somewhere north. Just because they're not blocking the sun over your head doesn't mean they're not blocking the sun for whoever's below them. Ah, I see what you're saying. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> for, like, Edmonton? Exactly. Why Edmonton? Mm, a red deer? Why Edmonton? I don't know. Hmm. How are you? I'm okay. Yeah, I'm okay. It's warming up a little bit, finally. There's kind of a kick in the fucking ass here this winter so far. Yeah, winter kicked in pretty hard and fast right at Halloween. Yeah, like it was pretty... It's been a while since the winter's come on that fucking fast and hard, I think. Yeah. It's like, boom. The one Sunday was plus 19. And then yep. the next Sunday it was minus 22. Yeah. Mind you, I, it hasn't really bothered me that much. I've kind of got used to it already. It's 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 okay. I'm kind of, I'm, I don't know. I'm not going to let it bug me. I almost find when it gets super cold like that right off the bat, uh, you season a little better. Yeah. You're not still dreading that cold spell because you've already got it. So that's about it. Complaining about the weather as usual. What's so I figured a you? nice thing to talk about on this uh, on this intro, kind of appropriate in a way. I think we addressed the California fires with Matt a little bit, but there's some. Have you have you been following that at all? I thought that was all done now. Yeah, but have you heard about some of the the you know the EM weapon theories and stuff like that? No. No, a whole on. bunch of houses have been basically like hit. Looks like Hiroshima, and there's you know hot burn, but not the houses have been burned, but not the trees. Electronic malfunctions, and what caused the fire? By was the fire caused by a direct energy weapon? Like many, many people saw electrical flashes that made no thunder in a perfectly clear blue sky, and worse, some people even saw small blue sparks everywhere in the air around them. And then it shows, you know, a bunch of homes that are completely fine and a bunch of them that are completely flattened by fire. Yeah, but I don't know. I've seen fire, how kind of how fire behaves. And that's how know, it jumps around. The yeah, you can see it in the bush where it's what like, about What about completely straight lines? Yeah, it would move in fairly straight and, and, well, the, and the buildings burned out, but the trees are okay right directly around the building. Like it is, and there's apparently something going on with the smart meters in all these these homes as well. Some people got heart palpitations. I don't. I can't speak to the people are reporting that their electronics malfunctioned before the fires hit, with the most pronounced about uh, being about malfunction at a hotel, the Silverado Resort and Spa, where all the systems f malfunctioned. I can't speak to the heart palpitation, <laughs> palpitations of the fucking that, but I think like the fire, fire can do some pretty weird things. Yeah, I could see the trees maybe not burning if they're still alive. A house is a lot more burnable than a green tree. And I don't know, I've sp I have spent some time fire in the bush mm -hmm. around fire, so I don't know, like it can definitely, you definitely see burn lines that are. I don't know about straight. What about the air being charged and the, that additional frequency in the air, you know? Yeah, that's just, you know, straight out of the X-Files. <laughs> I've never heard of that. You no. just brush it off because it's out of the X-Files? No, I'm not brushing it off. I don't know about, you know, I've never been in a, you know, a climate that's quite as hot as California is, I don't think, so... These places, I think it's hard for me to sort of relate to what, how dry and hot that air could actually be. Have you heard about the I know when I went term? to Phoenix, I Bum. was like, holy fuck, this is insane. And it was May. Yeah. And it was, what, Have 38 Celsius, 40 Celsius? Have you heard about the new term they're creating for weather? No. Bombogenesis? What? And weather weather whiplash? No. <laughs> Never heard of it. That's <laughs> they're, they're creating this term to describe the unprecedented geoengineered weather war, terrorism, 
that's being unleashed around people in the world, lately in the U.S. We all need to clearly understand that we are under attack with a very sophisticated technology by those who refer to us as human resources and useless eaters. Please share this with us, as well as the previous videos. All change begins with awareness and activism. So this is, I'll, I'll link to this in the show notes. It's uh, is that Corbett? interesting. No, no. Hmm. Huh. Wow. I wasn't expecting that. Right on, buddy. A good thing, <laughs> eh? Yeah, that's a nice, nice little touch there. What else you got? You got anything to play bombo Jingle Genesis? for? A little Bombo Genesis. That's like... <laughs> Some sort of weird genocide. In the end, it ends up being genocide. Sounds like a song to me. Sounds like uh, a misinformation campaign. You think they'll fall for Bombo Genesis? Sounds like uh, some of these fire captains have even going on and saying this, that apparently it's like an Agenda 21 thing. Highly decorated fire captain John Lord speaks out about the possible directed energy weapons used to start over 16 major fires that began in the middle of the night in the Napa, Sonoma, and Mendocino counties. To date, some three weeks later after the fires, officials have not gone on record to the origins of these fires. Probably it's Antifa. Antifa? Antifire? Antifa is not anti-fire. I don't know. You think so? What do they think? It's the Russians or, or no? What Chinese? Trump's in the no, forbidden it's disaster. City. It's disaster. Uh, How did fire start in the middle of the night? Disaster politics or disaster um, capitalism? Oh, so they go out and start the fire so that they can get the tax money and they can their insurance money. They can fix. They can fucking rebuild. I don't know. I don't know what it is. But you're you don't you're not sure what it is, but you're all in. <laughs> I'm not all in on anything. I'm just exploring it because Matt was on the show. We talked about it a little bit. It kind of fits in with the whole manipulation of our weather, the clouds. The and... man is an all-in believer in chemtrails. Our most popular ringtone. <laughs> Did you got a synchro for me? I do actually. Yeah, is it a gooder? I don't know what the classic. Uh, I don't know. Or is this one? Oh, actually, I, I, I. Oh, hang on. Once I hit the button, I can't unhit the button. Synchronicity, Graham reads it out, then Darum, I give it to me. Hey, don't you please read it low? Yeah, yeah. I think I already talked about the one with the moon and the bell in the kitchen. The guy listening to the tinfoil hat. No, I don't think so. I think I did. What if I? What if I read that? Because see, I've only got two weeks worth of emails on this computer. <laughs> <laughs> that might be so, the one that I didn't listen to. So maybe you should do it oh, again. Maybe, <laughs> that, that could be funny, actually. <laughs> Hey, Darren, I just started listening to the show this year. And the funny thing is, it was addressed to you. <laughs> and it was sent to you, and you forwarded it to me, and you still haven't heard it three times. If it's a sinker, I just forward it to you. I just started listening to the show this year, and I really love all the guests and the topic that you explore with them. Lately, I've been having heightened instances of small synchros and precognitive experiences. Nothing too outstanding to note, but add it all together, it feels like it's though it's all moving towards me, something more. A small synchro I had the other day uh, kind of blew my mind. I was working for an older lady doing some odd jobs around her house. I was painting her kitchen and listening to an episode of Tinfoil Hat with the hot to with the topic of the artificial moon. At what point? At one point, somebody was describing the projectile they shot at the lunar surface and related how it rang like a bell. Well, a fraction of a second after the bell word was spoken, the grandfather clock this woman owned chimed for a quarter to noon. A bell rang the moment the word bell was spoken. Nothing super crazy as sync goes, but thought it was pretty cool. 
eleven forty five adds up to eleven, which then could be two. I wasn't able to draw any significance from these numbers in relation to the moon. Maybe you guys have some thoughts. Hope you guys are doing well. Thanks for all the awesomeness and light you shine into the shadows. It's in the UK. I uh, don't know that Austin. Austin's from. I don't think Austin's from Austin, but. Anyways, I do think I read that before, and that probably was the one that you weren't listening to and you didn't rate, so... I'll give him a 6.42. I, I, all right, buddy. Thanks. And sorry to all the listeners if I did mess up on that one. So, hey, this is another one. I got uh, some feedback from... Jeez, I feel like I've read this, too. I'm really kind of having a bad moment here. Did I read about the one with the Grant Cameron episode and the guy talking about seeing the Charlie Red Star? Yes. You think? Yes. The one who has to admit that our show is probably the favorite over No Agenda and Higher Side Chats? No. <laughs> Read it. Love the show. <laughs> Love the show. The Grand Cameron episode was eye opening. Hello, Graham. Have to admit your show is probably my favorite over No Agenda and the Higher Side Chats. There was an episode I listened to over two years ago where it was mentioned that if you want to see a UFO-like phenomenon, then you have to look at the skies most nights. I've been doing this for roughly six months from my house near Pembroke, Ontario. And one night in August last year, I saw something in the southern sky that seemed to fit the description of Charlie Red Star. The object pulsated slowly. When it was at its dimmest, it was bright as the average star. When it was at its brightest, it appeared almost as a fireball. By far the brightest thing in the sky. That's not even the most striking thing about this object. As it traveled from east to west, it flew in a serpentine pattern like a sine wave. It moved. It was moving quite quickly across the sky. In about 15 seconds, it bolted south in a streak of light. It was an incredible sight and something I'll never forget. The Grand Cameron episode and the mention of Charlie Red Star compelled me to disclose my sight and keep up the great work. Alex. Pew, pew. Thank God. Thanks, Alex. You might have read that one already, actually. <laughs> this is like a duplicate intro. This is, like, brutal. You think so? I think yeah, so. Yeah, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll save the day. Just remember, you don't get the fades. Everyone else does, so just don't complain. Bingo, bingo. Social media jingle. Don't forget to rate, comment, and or subscribe. Django. So I'll save the day by going to the YouTubes. Actually, the YouTubes rarely save the day. What do we got uh, from friend of the show, David Matheson? Thank you, Graham and Darren, for graciously inviting me back to the Igloo to discuss the skies over Grimerica for the month of November. I've just published a short blog. I've just published, published. a short published. I just published. <laughs> <laughs> I've just. <laughs> I've just published a short blog post which adds a few links to some other myths associated with constellations visible in the heavens this month. Here at mathesoncorollary.blogspot.com slash 2017 slash 11 slash skies dash over dash grimerica dash november dash 2017.html. I'm a link to that in the show notes. <laughs> enjoyed our conversation and hope everyone else out there did too of course he was talking about our first ever skies across uh Grand america segment we got here from jay vel gotta run your audio out through both channels left and right yeah jay vel i know i run the fucking audio out through both channels man i'm telling you well, what happened on that then it always i don't know youtube doesn't seem to work but youtube gets the exact same feed that our main recording gets so i don't understand what the problem is Maybe he's got to plug his headphones in all the way. No, everyone says the same thing. Another, I say it's the same thing about what? About the one channel. It's a thing that happens for sure. Huh. 100%. Even in the chats while we're doing it. Uh, from Amber about the skies over Grimerica. Wow, this was too cool. Most of my life I've lived in the tropics. Now, living in the northern parts, such as Fairbanks, Alaska, and North Dakota, 
The explanation of the star map helped me out. I have spent most Friday nights since I was eight years old looking up and seeing a lot of unexplainable objects. And I've got a pretty good knowledge of the sky, but moving north was a bit of a change. Thank you for this information. Friday will be fun. Nice. Well, I got a lot of good feedback on Instagram as well, um, especially from our David uh, Bryan episode, the spiritual warfare one. That was a crazy episode. Um, And uh, we got a lot of reviews too. So it's nice that people are reviewing the show. I think that really does help especially in iTunes. Yes, that's right. Uh, we got another comment on our last episode, the grief dreams one. Um, after my mom died, I dreamt I went back to my childhood home. In my dream, she was glad to see me and said, there you are, like she had been waiting for me. The way she didn't, the way she was talking to me seemed she didn't know she had died. It was very upsetting because I had to tell her. True to life, she maintained a stiff upper lift, but I could tell she was upset or disappointed. Not much comfort in that grief dream, to be honest. Wow, I wonder if that actually released her her mom out of the limbo to move on to the afterlife. Yeah, maybe, so it might not have helped. That could have been like a soul rescue. It might not have helped her so much, but she might actually saved uh, she or he. I don't think I know if it's a boy or girl. The name is Elephant Shoes, so tough to say. And from our good friend Felix, the Jingle King. Sorry to hear, Elephant Shoes. I lost a family member this year. I feel you. Bless up, Darren and Graham. Thanks for all the good topics you cover. And she, he, uh, Elephant Shoes replied, Thank you for your kindness. An unexpected jewel amidst the wasteland of YouTube comments. <laughs> when my great-grandfather died, my great-grandmother could feel him slipping away and shook him to try and stop it. His dying words were, Why have you wakened me? It was so beautiful. They are at peace, and you will meet again. I think she was in the chats, and she's very funny and very very quick-witted. Quick-witted. Another comment on Skies Over Grand America. Love this segment. I hope it becomes a regular thing. Oh, here's actually another comment on the Dave Bryan episode. Like most Christian fundamentalists, Pastor Bryan doesn't know much about Aleister Crowley or Anton LaVey. The fact that a man is an authority with his own church does not make him an authority on opposing religious views. Yeah, good point. That's right. I can't remember if he was professing to be a... I mean, I think he was... It was more about, as I recall, more just about telling a crazy story. Based on, you know, a true story, but a crazy story nonetheless. I was actually... We, We got a ton of feedback on that episode. A bunch of people said it was their new favorite episode. Yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. That's right. So what I'm out of that. What do you got? A UFO quote. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> I happened to look up and there was that UFO right above the cornfield. It was just hovering right above the power lines. It was like, just like the ones you see on TV. Then it took off like a bullet, just tremendously fast. If I live to be a hundred, I'll never forget it. That was Henrico County Sheriff AD Toby Matthews in Richmond, Virginia, United States, August 9th, 1966. That's it, buddy. That's it. What about a synchro? No, I already did it. You got That's no it. more synchros? No. That's it. It's gonna be short up, so we're gonna get we're gonna get bad feedback. We oh, we didn't time. even ask we're for support. Two minutes. No, I talked to them. We're good. Did you really? Yeah. This is the prop. I'm local. Yeah, you are out of the loop, my friend. So what, what else want? do you got? We should ask for support, probably. Yeah, let's do that. Hang on, I might have the synchronicity here. We can't complain about not getting support if we never ask. Actually, we ask every show, I think. Check out America.ca slash support, guys. There's a bunch of different ways there to uh, yeah help support the show. There's a bunch of different monthlies there. Anything from a buck a month, 30 bucks a month, 
Uh, those really do help the best. If you can find it in your heart, just sign up for one of those today. If you enjoy the show, that definitely does help as we roll into winter. Got some more bills to pay. Hope we get some gas money into Graham's car so we can get him out to the studio so we don't have to do these non-local debacles. <laughs> uh, I was just thinking I saved like five bucks on coffee. <laughs> they save money on coffee and fuel. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, if you can do that, guys, it really does help. It gets you access to the bl- access to the block budget feed, too. Uh, you can do a one-time donation, too. That helps, too. The monthlies do really help the best. But if you can, if you haven't done that yet, you really should do that now. And, uh, yeah, it'll clear your conscience. It really does feel good to support the show. And uh, keeps, keeps the lights on and the heat on and it keeps us going. Keeps us going, yeah. Well, you, have, you have the people that do support the show to thank for the show. And, yeah, uh, and and the other thing is, if you can't financially contribute, then obviously a review on iTunes would be very very helpful, like we talked about earlier. These guys at the Tinfoil Hat were saying that they're they're shooting for a thousand reviews because they think that the algorithm will change at a thousand. So, you know, is that too much to ask for? Can we get to that? I mean, that would really step up the step up the uh, the show. I don't even think we're at a hundred. We've been around for a while. I know. So let's p- p- pump it. Yeah, we have quite a bit of listeners. There's really no reason we couldn't hit. If, like, even, like, 5% of you or 10% of you did it, then we would get up there pretty quick. So yeah, do that this exactly. week. And then everyone go and sign up for a buck a month, too. If you if you can't afford it, you can afford a buck a month. Get on there. Come on. Make it happen. You got another synchro? No, that's it. It's too long. It's too long? Yeah. Unbelievable. All right, guys. Uh, enjoy the chat with Mr. Uh, Matt Landman. It's a fun one. Uh, we will get Graham back in the studio next week. Get things back to normal. Something's out there in space that regulations don't cover. Ladies and gentlemen, please be given at ease. Station MXA. The regulations don't cover. This episode is long overdue. We have uh, we've been talking about chemtrails and geoengineering here for years now, eh, Darren? <laughs> years, at least a couple and, years, yeah. And we've been wanting to dig into it, so we've got uh, Matt Landman here, who's the creator of the Franken Skies documentary. Matt's been devoting himself to this research for this. It's a pretty complex topic. He'll get into all kinds of details, but he's been devoting himself to this for a few years now. And uh, we finally finally got him on the show, and it's good to have you here, Matt. Thanks for coming on, buddy. Thanks for the pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I don't even know where to begin because this is a pretty complex topic. So I'll give you a little bit of like, we talk about this in sort of a geoengineering sense. I I don't go too deep into, you know, the extreme part of the conspiracy on it because to me there's so much evidence just showing what's going on with our weather control and all this kind of stuff. Like they've been doing it for decades. So I've been sort of, you know, picking away at that over the years. Um, so I don't know, maybe we could, maybe we could start there, like, or, or we could talk about your background and how you kind of just came upon this research and started doing that. Uh, yeah, sure. Happily. I'll start with my background. No problem. Um, I grew up on the East coast, just outside of Washington, DC. Um, I'd like to convey to people, especially people that are new to this or young or trying to figure out what my story is. I'm just a normal, um, pretty average person. You know, I didn't come from any money or anything like that. Um, I got out of high school and went right into Virginia Tech and studied business there for four years. And after university, I dabbled in all sorts of different fields of 
of employment. I worked in the restaurant industry. I worked in um, the banking industry as a mortgage broker. I worked in stock market. I worked in real estate. And I really wanted to get into film, but um, Virginia never had a... Um, a film school, so I studied business instead, and ultimately I moved out to Southern California yeah. in 2003. I moved to Los Angeles and found myself working in San Diego. Uh, I was the vice president of this triathlon wetsuit company, actually called Xterra Wetsuits, and um, did you know just living a normal life, you know, chasing chasing that money and trying to. Um, have some life experiences, but you know, I'm not, I'm nobody that special or anything, you know, but finally I moved up to Northern California and I got my master's degree in business and studied film there. Got a little bit of background in, the, in how to work a film camera and what have you. Yeah. And then I got out of work and I worked in finance some more. I was a finance analyst. Uh, I was good at predicting uh, just analytics stuff, statistics stuff, and where the price of gold and silver was going to go and all this stuff. So so I did that. And then finally, I didn't want to work for the man anymore, and I worked for this nonprofit and called Internews, which was pretty interesting and neat. And still, it was it was still pretty corrupted and corporatized and all this <laughs> stuff. So I got, the, I got an opportunity to work on a farm. So I, so I figured, you know... I'm living in this rural Northern California, beautiful landscape. I might as well get outside and, and see what's up with all of that. And I had no idea how little I knew about just agriculture. I, I didn't know that a potato in the ground grew potatoes. I had gone through all these layers of ex education. Um, supposedly Fairfax County uh, was the best public school, public um, where I went to high school and everything, was the best public school system in the country, they call it. Mm -hmm. So I went through that. I went to four years of Virginia Tech, a couple more years working on my master's of business. I got out of school at the age of 32, and I didn't know that a potato in the ground grew potatoes. Like, that's really sad, you know what I mean? Like, this entire indoctrination um, conditioning that we go through, we think we're learning stuff, and we're not learning any of the basics that we should so I ended up on this farm, and I learned a lot about a lot. And while I was out there getting literally grounded and growing squash and pumpkins and potatoes, 12 varieties of potatoes. I really like the purple ones, um, by the way. They're the healthiest, in my opinion. But, yeah, I'm out there, and I witness weather manipulation. I'm, I'm working on a farm where we're reliant on the sun and the rain and all that. Yeah. And where I lived in Northern California – is um, they call it the mouth of the atmospheric river where the jet stream comes off of the Pacific Ocean traditionally and then it uh, pulls across the United States, the jet stream, and brings the moisture, um, the flow of moisture to the whole uh, transcontinental United States. Well, generally speaking, the Pacific Northwest from around San Francisco all the way up to Canada, they get this seasonal deluge where this moisture comes off the Pacific Ocean every fall and it lasts for a few months, three to four months, starting in around November till around April. It just rains kind of nonstop. And people make jokes about how depressing Seattle is because of all the rain they get. It's mostly this atmospheric river jet stream that pulls off of the ocean that brings that moisture in. Mm -hmm. And these ancient redwoods, these ancient redwoods, which I'm actually sitting amongst right now for the show. I'm happy that you were able to pick me up on the phone and not through Skype so I can come out in the forest because I am uh, visiting in Northern California right now. Um, these ancient redwoods, they're used to their seasonal deluge, right? They get their seasonal, it's an ecosystem. They get their seasonal rain every fall. Yep. And we were in this, we were in this catastrophic drought where we hadn't had that seasonal deluge for five years and everyone was wondering, you know, what was going on and the media is kind of pushing this global, or excuse me, geo, or climate uh, change, global warming, global yeah. warming, yeah. climate change yeah. thing. Uh, all these words. So, you know, and that was all a big hoax, but I didn't know at the time. And, and I'm thinking, oh, man, climate change, we're in a drought, just, <laughs> just screwed up. And we were told that we had a 100% chance of rain. And we were in the midst of a catastrophic drought. Mm -hmm. um, my house that I was living in, this apartment, um, it was an old Victorian that got it into a, these apartments. I was living in this apartment. But underneath my house was three feet of space because of all the moisture, usually like of uh, the, the area that I live in was worried about mold. So there's this area, it's such a moist area that they put the house, the houses up a few feet and literally 
the entire ecosystem thought it was going to rain. There were frogs and salamanders coming out from underneath my building that I'd never even seen before because these big black storm clouds were rolling in and they're long overdue. And the, the weatherman, my farmer boss, the trees and the amphibious creatures all thought we were going to get this big storm. There's a hundred percent chance of rain for a week. And up until then, I was a pretty normal guy. And then I witnessed weather manipulation on the edge of this storm. So huh. I've got a background in statistics, okay? And I can totally eye a, an anomaly in statistics, okay? Like I'm good at um, it, like analyzing stock market stuff. And if a stock has gone down too much or whatever, I can, you know, kind of tell you that there's a 99% chance that this thing's going to rebound. Whatever, you know, I'm, I'm good at looking at numbers and seeing anomalies and outliers and statistical statistically significant aberrations from the norm, okay? And in this instance, where I worked on this farm, and I'm out there on the coast, it's about a half mile from the coast, this one Warren Creek farm that I worked on. Where I worked, you could hear the waves, and you could see the storms coming off of the ocean. And in this instance, whereas I usually would see a very sparse air traffic, I would say upwards to 10 planes in an entire day I would see, okay? And no uh, pattern of appearance to them. Like, they would just come sporadically. They wouldn't come all at once or anything like that. It wasn't anything like I witnessed. But on the edge of the storm pattern, I saw a statistically significant uptick in air traffic. Mm -hmm. And this air traffic were, were large jets, and they were crisscrossing the sky on the edge of the storm. And not only was there a statistically significant uptick in air traffic, but all of these planes were leaving persistent linear cirrus clouds out of the back of the jets. And so I didn't think anything of it, but I was curious, you know, why are all these planes flying around all of a sudden? Why do they look like they're crisscrossing in this grid pattern in the sky? Yep. And then, and then when the storm came, and I'm out there working every day in my rain boots, harvesting pumpkins because it was mid-October and we were, ra we were afraid of the pumpkins rotting out in the field, you know, because when it rains, things mold and what have you. And when was this and again? 2000 and... But this was like 2014, 2015. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, pardon me. This is 2014. And when the rain didn't fall out of the clouds at all, we didn't get a single drop of rain, I started kind of wondering what the heck happened, right? But still, my cognitive distance got in the way, and I would never have thought that anybody or the Air Force or anything plane-related was messing with the weather. Like, I just never had that in my head at all. Yeah. And this one day, this one day, but I tabled it. I, I shelved it. Okay. I shelved that information. People have these memory banks in their head and they have seen things that they don't really know what they're really seeing. And they have these memories. Okay. So that's kind of actually really important for people that are waking up to it because they can think about, well, actually I've seen lots of blue sky days where there's not 10 planes in the sky all at once or whatever doing things. So what happened was, is I reached out to a friend back home on the East Coast, and I was venting about um, how people, like, um, didn't know about 9-11 or some sort of truth-oriented thing, but never deep into the rabbit hole like I was about to go. And he says to me, literally, kind of in a passing comment, he said, yeah, people can deny that because they weren't in New York on that day, and people can deny the GMO because they don't know the science behind it, but what about chemtrails? That's right in your face. All the time. And I said, what? I said, what's that? You know what I mean? It's been it that simple. I said, what do you mean? What's that? And he goes, you don't know about chemtrails? I go, no. And he's like, you're the one that woke me up to 9-11. You don't know about chemtrails? <laughs> I'm like, no, man. Tell me. Tell me. And he's like, well, the plane supposedly messed with the weather and stuff, you know? And it just like dinged in my head. I was out there on the farm and I witnessed it and I saw it, right? So I went home and kind of dug around on the internet. And the first thing that pulls up is some misinformation, disinformation, misleading stuff. So immediately I was like, Oh, I shouldn't worry about this, you know, but I'm a normal guy. And so they target those normal guys. They know how I've built my mental constructs, how my brain is, you know, how they formed the way, how I've been programmed, how they formed the way that I think. And ultimately I, I witnessed it again on the farm. And that took me full circle back to digging more on the internet. And I saw some documentaries that I thought were pretty crappy. And I thought to myself, well, I could do a much better job. And I started asking people, do you know about chemtrails? Do you know about geoengineering? 
And the only people that knew about chemtrails were the people that laughed at me and said that that's a conspiracy theory, right? Nobody knew the word geoengineering. Nobody knew that chemtrails were ongoing. Nobody knew anything. So ultimately, I got uh, kind of upset about that. And, and coming from a business background and having a master's in business and knowing all this analytical stuff and what have you, I knew that there was a really big gap to, to be filled, right? Like if I was starting a business and chemtrail awareness, I'd be like, okay, the whole world is an open market because nobody knows about it. You yeah, know what I mean? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got, I, got, I got no competition in my niche kind of thing yeah, for awareness. Yeah, yeah. Aspect. So either way, I decided that I wanted to make an impact and I decided to devote my life to it. And that was just under three years ago. I completely decided that I'd devote my every day to it. So every day, if I'm on the grind making money somehow, working, it's making money to put towards chemtrails. If I'm posting on Facebook, it's raising awareness for that truth. If I'm uh, launching my website, actualactivists.com, it's control oriented primarily. If I made a movie, Franken's Guide, control oriented. I've been hosting different conferences. I'm, I'll be on my third global control summit this coming I mean, spring in 2018. Um, and so that's exciting. But I've, I've hosted, uh, I would say, about 15 small um, events speaking about chemtrails and and I just started going, you know, I look back on things that I did a year and a half ago and I feel like I'm a little kid in those presentations. Um, <laughs> I've, I've just, I've just been like kind of running with it and I feel like I've finally gotten somewhat articulate on the matter and I can answer everybody's who, what, why, where's and wins on the subject. And, and the film is, is more ammo and, and more steam to keep it going. And, and I feel like I'm kind of spearheading this movement to bring, some truth and transparency and scrutiny to an ongoing crime against humanity that really needs some attention. Right. I agree. It needs attention. So what were some of the things that you, uh, that you saw when you started looking into it that made you realize like, okay, this is, this is, uh, something that I got to pay attention to, like besides the geoengineering and stuff. I mean, was there other things like what kind of evidence did you see that you, that you couldn't ignore? Uh, well, it was the, it was the, well, first of all, the history of it all. I found out that in 1916, <laughs> that San Diego was experiencing a drought, uh, was experiencing drought, okay? And the city of San Diego actually hired, so one thing that people, it's hard to wrap people's heads around, is there's a lot of history about this that we're not told in our mainstream media and exactly. all that. Exactly. Right? That's what got us, too. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can pull up old newspaper clippings and stuff from like the 50s and 60s and they're talking about how they're manipulating the weather and who's going to get the rain and are we going to be able to vote to see who gets the rain and is the rain going to cost money and all this stuff. Like they don't talk about that anymore because they've advanced their technology so much that they don't want us to know about it at all. Yeah. So that's really interesting. So in 1916, San Diego was in a, a pretty pretty um, bad drought. But if you know about San Diego and L.A., it's like that's a desert oasis. Like they're... They're just pulling off the Colorado River and the Navajo Indians and all these people are, are getting kind of screwed over by these large cities being um, unsustainable and what have you. But either way, this, um, San Diego was in a catastrophic drought in 1916. And this Professor Hatfield, he claimed that he could build a tower 30 to 40 feet tall and climb up there and spray this silver dust concoction into oncoming clouds and make them empty their rain. And the city of San Diego was like, go for it. We'll give you, we'll <laughs> finance this and please, and thank you. And he went up there and he was like, let's see if we can make this happen. And he busted the dams. It flooded. It flooded San Diego. The dams busted and they, they held him responsible and they were mad at him. Right. And he was like, look, I did it because of you. I was just doing an experiment. I had no idea I was going to flood the place. And they, they were upset. But that was the very beginning of what is now weather weaponry and manipulation and weather control. And so shortly thereafter, um, I mean, this is 1916. So shortly thereafter in the 20s, there was research that learned that not only can you make it rain, but you can make it not rain. So what it is is the silver iodine concoction that they put up there, the silver dust, essentially, is silver ends up being hydroscopic, which means that the water molecules that are in and on uh, a passing cloud, mm -hmm. these water molecules, attract, they attract to the silver molecules. On, a, on, a, on like an atom, like uh, uh, a basis, on a, 
yeah, on a molecular, thank you, on a molecular basis, we've got these little water molecules in the clouds. Well, if you've got silver dust that you apply, the silver will actually attract the water molecules. Multiple water molecules will go to one silver um, atom or molecule or whatever, and then they'll get heavy and they'll drop rain. It's called cloud seeding. Mm -hmm. And and that, that same chemical concoction is still used with ski resorts to make it rain when clouds come by. And it's, it's actually well known, and they're really good at it. And, and come the 60s, they were so good at it that they used rain as a weather weapon to flood Vietnam. Yep. Um, the Ho Chi Minh Trail is a trade route. The Ho Chi Minh Trail, the trade route, was flooded uh, by the U.S. Air Force. Project Popeye, um, was it? Or something? I can't remember what it was called. Project, Project Popeye, Popeye, I think. Yes, exactly. And this is really well known to people who do, do a little research, but to some... We that are new to it, <laughs> yeah. they're like, are you kidding? They're, they're, you know, they'll be in denial or whatever, but it's actually fact. It's factual. And during that same time frame, they aerosolized Agent Orange, which is an herbicide, which caused lots of birth defects and all this stuff. And and then, you know, at, at that point when they're aerosolizing um, chemicals such as that, that are nanotoxins and all this stuff, it kind of gets beyond the aspect of geoengineering. You know, these are actually chemical trails that are, harmful and all this stuff. But that started in, in Vietnam. I mean, not started, but that was proliferated in Vietnam, got really crazy and popular. And then afterwards, an international treaty was signed because all the countries in the world were like, we can't start using weather weaponry on each other and everybody's going to be stealing each other's rain and it's going to get nuts because they saw the U.S. did. And so they set a precedent. They signed international treaties, but the treaties didn't say that you couldn't do it against your own people. Okay? <laughs> and so... Around this time frame, when everything's developing and they're learning about it all, they also learned that you can make it not rain with aluminum. So oxidized aluminum, aerosolized, okay, this is nanoparticulate form, aluminum can be sprayed in the atmosphere to an on incoming um, storm system, okay? And if they do it to the clouds just like they do the silver, the opposite of what the silver does occurs. So the opposite of hydroscopic um, is probably the, is probably there's probably a word for that. But what it does is it dissipates, it spreads out the moisture. So the aluminum, when you spray it, it spreads out, and it spread and the moisture of the the water molecules will attract to the aluminum just the same, but they'll spread out and dissipate, and each molecule of aluminum would pull some water with it, and it doesn't get heavy enough to drop out. Okay, it actually will prevent a storm from dropping its rain. So what I witnessed on that farm in Northern California on that day that it eventually ended up changing my life forever is I witnessed aluminum being sprayed. So once I started really digging into it and I was like, well, what did I see that day and how could it be and la, 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 you know, and I wanted to sink my teeth into something that made sense, I started finding patents on aluminum. Right, on using aluminum to mess with clouds and to make it not rain and stuff. And I was like, whoa, there's patents. You know, you patent somebody something when you have the technology so somebody doesn't take that technology. You don't patent things when you have the idea. You patent it after you've actually made it happen. So I was like, wow, looking at the dates on these patents. And then I see that Monsanto has patented aluminum-resistant genetic seeds. And I'm like, oh, yeah, these evil bastards ran on it, too. This Ooh. is making kind of sense. And then I found that people in California had been witnessing the same thing as me and that they were really eager to get the, the random activists uh, uh, across California. They were really eager to get rainwater samples because they were really suspect of all of these grid pattern, persistent linear cirrus clouds that were coming out of the back of jets that they didn't see during their childhood. You know, the barometric pressure was the same during their childhood, but now... The planes are acting differently, even though the engines are so advanced now that they shouldn't even have any contrails at all. These new high bypass turbofan jet engines, they re they cool the air as it comes out of the engine, so you don't have the superheated air coming out of the back to cause these condensation trails. So really, when you see a jet in the sky and it has no trail behind it, and you're like, oh, what's going on today? That's normal, right? Yeah, that's, that's well, that's what I remember when I was a kid. I remember there would be a little contrail and then it would just dissipate right away like you know it, it would be there like you know for a very very small period of time now 
you know, now they, they seem to stretch out. There seems to be a bunch of different types. You know, there's some that sort of dissipate fairly quickly and you can't really say it's a chemtrail because it's too quick. And then there's some that just linger around forever. And it just, that blows me away. But yet the mainstream, you know, skeptics in the media still have, I mean, what is their answer now for, for why that sticks around? They say that it's like you're making cloud, it's an unintentional, you know, cloud making, isn't it? Like basically the the condensation from the engine is creating clouds, right? At a certain temperature. Which, which is virtually impossible given this new high-tech engine. So, but, but really that's kind of hard to prove because there's different fuel additives that are being added to the fuel, especially JP8 jet fuel. Well, that's it's what I wanted to ask you about too. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's been tested as well, right? So some of these chemicals are in the jet fuel as well. Right, exactly. And so I, I want to um, I want to answer your question really quick. So you asked me what I was able to find on the internet that really got me going, and it was the rainwater analysis. Oh, okay. People were okay. seeing analyses. Um, people were seeing the the grid patterns in the sky, and the storms would go by and not drop any rain. But some of the storms would drop a little bit of rain, and people would be like, "Okay, we're in this crazy drought. It looks like they're messing with the weather. Let's test what this rain is putting out." And they would find astronomic levels of aluminum like i'm talking 20 times any health and safety standards limit and and they're also finding titanium and cadmium and barium and strontium and all these other toxic metals that that there's no way would be in high amounts in the sky i don't care how much um pollution china's putting out or whoever (laughs) is it it wouldn't make any it just doesn't make any sense at all there's no there's no rhyme or reason about to it at all um (laughs) I'm sorry, and then you just asked another question. Well, no, um, it was just it was well, just like what what is the skeptical response uh, about why these persistent contrails exist now? And you know they don't want to call them chemtrails, so they're calling them you know persistent contrails. And they, you know, what's their answer? Because I, it's it's just a, you know, it's a tricky thing well, because you've got all the you've got all the weather modification that's that's like documented. It's going on for sure. But then to take the to take the evidence to the next level, it gets pretty. Dicey because you're you, you know there's this whole debate between the persistence of these comtrails slash chemtrails. Well, that's great. Let's play their game for a minute. And they say that global warming is really bad, and that climate change is really bad, and that we have to do something about it. Well, let's talk about these vapor trails, as they call it. If they are just vapor trails, then let's just have that conversation. Do you know what the number one greenhouse gas is? Carbon dioxide. It's water vapor. No, carbon dioxide is not even close <laughs> to number one. Have you the seen that? One, they, they take water out. Gas. Actually, they take water out when they show you that pie chart. It's not even including water, right? So it makes it look really, really right. crazy. Right. Yeah. So, so to really have an informed scientific conversation about global warming and climate change, first we need to talk about water vapor. Okay, well, if water vapor is the number one greenhouse gas and these planes are gridding the sky and leaving a milky white haze that bellows out all day long, let's not even go there and say that it's aluminum and barium and strontium and that they're manipulating the weather. Let's go with the official um, dialogue on it or whatever. And it's, if, it's, if it is just water vapor, then it needs to be addressed, it needs to be scrutinized, and it needs to be regulated because too much water vapor is going to heat up the planet too fast, and there's so many airplanes traveling, and la 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 la. Like, if if it is only water vapor, even then, it needs to be addressed and scrutinized. Yeah, and they so won't even, even then, now, and they won't even use that in the statistics. That's the problem. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So the official explanation is that these engines, which have been altered to cool down and be really efficient to cool down the the exhaust, that somehow this superheated exhaust is um, nucleating ice crystals and making ice crystals spread out and causes like this trigger reaction of ice crystals to just ice up the whole sky basically, which really doesn't make any sense, especially if you look in your history books and you, and you know the whole math behind it and all that. But they'll have you digging down these rabbit holes such as the Appleman chart that has you analyzing barometric pressure and temperature of the atmosphere. And then you get really confused because if you're on the ground, how are you to know what altitude exactly this plane is flying at and how are you to know exactly 
the barometric pressure and the temperature of the atmosphere, and then you're able to just turn a blind eye to all of it and say, I'm no weatherman, and move on with your day. Exactly, also, even, though, even though it wasn't happening back then. Like, so, so how, what did they say about why it wasn't happening 25, 30 years ago and why it's happening now? Like, are, is there an excuse that there's, you know, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere now and it's this extra shit that we're, that, you know, that the, the slaves are pumping into the atmosphere that's causing the, these uh, extensions now? Or, what, what, like, how can they explain the difference? Well, there is the claim that it's been going on the whole time. Huh, and yeah. if, you look, and you look, if you look at the history of it all, they've been researching for quite some time, but never has it been to this degree. Never in my lifetime. And I know, I don't know how old you are, but my parents and my grandparents, never would they see such irregulars in the pattern of appearance of the planes. Never, never would they see such phenomenon they had to update the cloud atlas and add 12 new clouds last year i thought that was a joke actually no me too i honestly did for like a week and then i saw all this buzz on facebook and all these activist oriented people were, <laughs> were freaking out about it and i was like hold on this was real i thought someone was spoofing the camp like that's, like, that's what like i thought fun of how, yeah like spoofing the media making fun of how corrupted they are and saying like, oh, man, we've got new clouds. Because they were showing chemtrails and saying, oh, look, we've got these clouds. We've got to update these clouds. No, so and even the name of it. Even the name of it was like uh, human created or something like that. You know, like, uh, you know, I can't remember what the name was. Uh, yeah. Homo it, mutated. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it gets, it gets really deep and involved when you start digging down all that and seeing that the media is completely involved that even the cloud atlas is completely involved. The scientists are paid off. And it, it comes down to this select elite group who claim that they have exclusive rights to saving the planet through geoengineering. There's a paper out of Northwestern University out of Chicago through Warren, Be Warren Buffett, because Warren Buffett's all part of this globalist agenda, and Bill Gates especially, and David Keith, the primary solar geoengineer. He yeah, he lives right. Himself. He's right near us here in uh, Cochrane. Uh, sorry, uh, what's the place, Darren? Right there. They uh, remember we had him. We were talking about him because when when that big bill, billboard was put up about spraying our skies, and then Canmore, David, Canmore, yeah. And then he was uh, he he came out publicly and started talking about how geoengineering could save. Just exactly what um, Matt's saying here. Um, yeah, he, 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 he's a professor at Harvard, but he's from Calgary, I believe. And he's, he's a total puppet. You know, he, he's um, out there saying that the solution to global warming is to spray the skies from balloons and planes yep. with aluminum yep. to block out the sun to slow down global warming. The photos of what they say that they need to do which is geoengineering, the, the photos that they show are exactly what we see you know, with our own eyes. They claim that it's not ongoing, but they do say that they're going to launch it in Tucson this spring, and they want to have full-scale deployment within the next couple of years. They've set up governance bodies. Last, last year in May, they set up the, global, uh, they set up the solar geoengineering governance regime, a self-proclaimed regime, who, like I said, they claim that they have exclusive rights to saving the planet through geoengineering. It's actually a paper that was written with all these guys, these science, quote-unquote scientists involved, that say that they don't have to go through patent law, that they don't have to ask permission from the public, oh. they don't have to go through any sort of political system because they have this technology that they must deploy or humanity will forever be lost. Oh, I think those are the same guys that make the vaccines. No, you think so? Well, Gates is way, way up in there for sure. I wonder if all that aluminum in there is to try and evolve a new people that is more... Docile? Or more fucking ready to face an aluminum world. So you're so you're looking at all the vaccines, Darren, and you're noticing some like similarities here between who's behind it and the type of chemicals you're using? Yeah, a little bit. Huh. I mean, just vaguely. Yeah. No, that's 100% accurate, and whenever I talk to people who are looking to really connect the dots, I give them one word, which is aluminum. 
You've got Monsanto and their aluminum-resistant genetics. You've got dementia and Alzheimer's going through the roof because of the aluminum into the brain. You've got aluminum interacts with fluoride. Fluoride. Oh, I I don't know if I knew that. Yeah, fluoride crosses the blood-brain barrier. It's in our toothpaste, it's in our tap water, it's in a lot of our food. Well, it's and not in my toothpaste. Cross- Sorry, my kids, haven't been, my kids haven't had to face yeah. any of that bullshit. I love it. Yeah, I didn't mean to say our. No, I mean, I'm, just I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It is. <laughs> but what happens is, is aluminum gets escorted into the brain with the fluoride. Fluoride will actually pull the aluminum in your system, which we're getting exposed to through the flu, the flu shot. We're getting exposed to aluminum through the vaccines. We're getting exposed to aluminum through the chemtrails. All of that gets in our system, and then when we uptake the fluoride, it goes straight past our blood-brain barrier, which we develop when we're, when we're three years old. It takes the, the aluminum into our brain, and then the aluminum and the fluoride have a chemical reaction, and they totally make new chemicals and have these chemical reactions, little explosions in your brain, in your brain, which causes this dementia and Alzheimer's spike that we're seeing. It's actually killing the bees. The aluminum is killing the bees. The aluminum, yeah, it's everywhere. So it's, it's, a, it's really, it's really, 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 really just. Who sells aluminum? It, it's aluminum. And we got to get this aluminum out of our bodies. We got to get it out of our plant and it disrupts the uptake of water for plants and trees and it makes these trees into little explosives because these trees are lined with aluminum. It's crazy. It's just disgusting, too, how they can take liberty over messing with our weather. Like, they've been doing it for 100 years now. But, like, who, who, oh, it's just, it's just so annoying. That feels um, very, um, what's the word I'm looking for, Dan? Like, it's obtrusive to me. Like, you're going to mess with our fucking skies when you don't even know the result of that. Like, I don't I care what you say. Feel, There's no scientific evidence that says that all that shit's safe, and they're just going ahead and doing it anyway. It's just like the vaccines and just like Monsanto, but this seems to be just taking it to a new level. It, dri- it drives me nuts, you know? Violated. And then this whole global warming thing, and there's weather manipulation going on everywhere, and nobody's even taking that into account. It's just mind-boggling. Which is completely accurate. You can't talk about global warming if you're not going to mention ionospheric heaters. Exactly. The ionosphere, the ionosphere is where our jet stream lives. It's where a lot of moisture flows and a lot of weather patterns go through this ionosphere. It's a layer of our atmosphere. I believe just above us is the troposphere, and then there's the stratosphere, and then there's the ionosphere. I should get that down. I'm pretty sure that's accurate. But either way, the ionosphere is manipulated through this Tesla technology, which goes back to this HAARP, H-A-A-R-P, which is in Alaska. Yeah, and all all over the place now, I think, probably, in smaller smaller, uh, versions. The High Altitude Aurora Research Project? That one? Yeah. Yes, exactly. The HARP station in Alaska, they've shrank it down through DARPA, and they have these smaller versions of it that are even more powerful that are all over the planet. There's dozens of them now, and they are called ionospheric heaters. Through frequency, these um, this technology, it focuses on a focal point in the atmosphere, and it superheats that point. And with the assistance of man- nanoparticulate metallics, you can superheat the atmosphere even more and you can create what, what they do with that is they create high pressure and that the high pressure you can storm, you can um, steer storm systems, you can steer the jet stream, you can create tornadoes, create hurricanes, all this stuff just by creating these high pressure upward drafts. So they now, did create Harvey to fuck with Trump. <laughs> yeah. Harvey was definitely manipulated and, and there were moisture plumes created by power plant just um, near Houston on the land that fueled the storm. The storm doubled back three times to <laughs> pick up these moisture plumes coming oh. off the ground to completely flood Houston. Fuck. Oh, it's just disgusting. So, so um, keep going then. Go ahead. No, go for it. Well, I was just going to expand on the, you know, the ionospheric heaters and, um, yeah, well, okay, where can we go from here? So there's all these, I mean, we, I got a million questions, so let's try and try and stay uh, 
stay on the path here. So there's now there's multiple. I feel like there's multiple different things going on. You know, it's it's added in the jet fuel possibly. There's um there's there's uh there's some tanks like right within the planes, like special planes just f- just for this specific reason. And there's also just the cloud seeding type stuff that's happening. So do you think it's happening at a bunch of different levels and different organizations that are doing it for different reasons? Uh, for sure, it's definitely multifaceted. Um, there was, you can look this up, Operation Big Itch, where fleas were actually aerosolized and dropped over Alabama. They've also aerosolized ticks. They've aerosolized mosquitoes. They've aerosolized lithium. There's this lithium fog that this researcher, Ann Fillmore, has discovered that when there's heavy spray off the coast of Oregon, that a, a lithium fog comes rolling in. They're spraying lithium on Portland, Oregon, and all over the coast of Oregon. So that's a different, totally different than geoengineering, spraying the population with lithium. There's different um, things that are coming up in rainwater that are synthetic biology that are called self-replicating fiber, uh, self-replicating carbon fiber nanotubes. People call it more gallons, and people are being treated with these fibers growing out of their skin. They claim it's from the chemtrails, from the rainwater, and all this stuff. It gets really deep and really complicated. Even the CIA coins it stratospheric aerosol injections. Yeah. But then you've got solar, solar radiation management and a whole governing body. There's a solar radiation management governance initiative through NASA, which NASA is completely corrupted. They were formed by Nazi scientists, Operation Paperclip after World War II. Mm-hmm. NASA it paid $54 million per day. That's their budget, $54 million a day. And they're completely bogus and shady. They have a program called the CARE program, C-A-R-E. It's the Charged Aerosol Release Experiment, where they make ionized clouds. They call them noctilucent clouds by mixing barium, strontium, and aluminum in your atmosphere. They don't know how many, they don't know how many of the radioactive particles fall to the ground. They claim that they, quote, use the atmosphere as a laboratory. That's a NASA quote from a recent NASA presentation where they claim that they're mixing barium, strontium, and aluminum, nanoparticulate metallic, in the atmosphere, these charged aerosols to create these these, um, ionized radioactive clouds, literally. So that's where that $54 million budget daily is going to poisoning the populace and destroying the ecosystem of the planet. What but about exploring space? Don't they spend at least some of it on that? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. So either way, <laughs> um, you know, who, who really knows? It, it's pretty dark once you get into the whole NASA thing. Yeah. But as you dig into it, there's there's a tropospheric aerosol program. If you are able to look at the tropospheric aerosol program document from the Department of Energy in the year 2001, this document was released and they identify how they're going to shape out the budget for the next decade. They put a grid pattern of different chemicals over the city of Nashville, Tennessee. They put up research uh, drones and balloons and all these different instruments to study the aerosol plumes and see which chemicals are mixing how and why and where and what it's doing. And they through the Department of Energy, launched what they call the Tropospheric Aerosol Program through the Department of Energy, which the Department of Energy, Energy is totally in on it. If you think about it, they're trying to block out the sun. They're going to ruin all the sustainable energy stuff like solar. And where do they get the nanoparticulate chemicals that they spray in the sky? Well, it comes from coal-burning power plants. Yeah. The coal-burning power plants, they filter their smokestack and they end up with this stuff called coal fly ash. Fly, I was going to ask you about that, yeah. That stuff goes right on a plane, uh, on a train, and the train goes straight to the Air Force bases, where they filter out the nanoparticulate metallic that they want, and sometimes they just spray the crap right into the atmosphere without even filtering it. And it, it's disgusting. It's, it's full of cadmium and strontium and all these horribly um, harmful metallics. That's where you know, they're, that so that's where they're trying to use all the fucking waste products from other things, you know? Like, they probably get that aluminum from something that they do as well. And, I mean, even fluoride is a waste product, I think, from aluminum. I'm making aluminum. So, yeah, exactly. that's fucking yeah. disgusting. So, what's, so, and then what about the other, um, 
the other some of the other agendas, let's say. So, so what? So why are they doing all this? Is it for weather modification? Like whether it's uh, solar radiation management? Is that is that all? Is that all legit? Or and 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 besides besides all the like local weather modification, like when we're talking about big picture stuff, is it for that? Or have you have you heard about this whole three D battlefield type stuff? Is it is it a multi purpose for some sort of global uh, warfare technology? Uh, yes, yes, all those things, yes, and yes, and yes. So um, this, my film that I just put up on Vimeo and YouTube, the director's cut of okay. my film, Frank and Skies. Frank and Skies, yeah. In the film, Frank and Skies, I, it, it's just an introductory to the whole thing. You know, it doesn't get deep into the space fence. It doesn't get deep into the synthetic biology or frequency manipulation as much as it <laughs> will in my sequel because in the sequel I'll be talking about all this other deeper stuff that gets deeper down that investigative uh, rabbit hole as people call it. So I hosted the first annual Global Chemtrail Summit in Vancouver and I had one of my speakers was Ilana Freeland. Yep. She has authored a book, Heart Chemtrails and the Full Spectrum Dominance of Planet Earth. Oh. She, came, she came and presented at my next conference which, is in, which was in Portland this past May, Portland, Oregon, and she spoke again, and now she's speaking about um, the ch- supercharged ionosphere and how they're weaponizing the ionosphere, and she's got a new book um, called The Space Fin. And, and yeah, they're, it, 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 uh, they want to supercharge the ionosphere to create this grid of control over the entire planet. If you look at interviews from the president of Iran, President Ahmadinejad, he is well aware that his country is being targeted with ionospheric manipulation and they're draining the clouds before they get to his country. So it's already weather as a weapon of war, okay? Covert war, you know, we haven't declared war on Iran yet. Um, but not. But that aside, it, it gets really, really deep and complicated when, when you start really digging into the supercharged ionosphere and the space fence technology, and they claim it's so that they can evaporate a, a nuke that's coming from another country and they can just zap it with their grid in the sky and their supercharged ionosphere and all this stuff. But ultimately, everything that they say is totally bogus. So how can we ever think that they're out to protect us? You know, I think it's part of this frequency control where they can um, they can lower layers of the atmosphere and literally crank a frequency that bounces off the cloud layer and bounces off the ground layer, mm. and they can manipulate the frequency of an entire city. So we harmonize at a frequency that is similar to the Schumann residence of the entire planet, like 7.34 hertz or something around there. All of our organs work with frequency, our heart, our brain, all of us resonate at a frequency. And if you can manipulate the frequency in the air that's around us, you can manipulate the frequency of the people. Okay. And that is the future or the modern day really, but that's the future we're going to be dealing with is where mind control on a mass spectrum is an actual realistic thing that is ongoingly being experimented with, but the research is getting so advanced that we're, we're on the cusp of a totally fucked up dystopian AI future where people are excited to become robots and their minds are being controlled through the frequency with the cell towers, the I, the ion, ionized ionosphere, and everything is, is totally connected and correlated to just controlling the frequencies of the planet and, and giving everybody cancer, basically. Fuck, I mean, everything is frequency. I mean, we've talked about that in different levels on the show. I mean, everything from, you know sound healing and all kinds of uh, chimatics and everything is fascinating. So that, that doesn't surprise me that they would go that route really. How are they protecting yeah, exactly. themselves? Well, that's exactly where I was, what I was about to mention is um, how to take all of this and go full circle out of fear and empower ourselves with the education and the info and be able to actually protect ourselves because they must be as well. For one, these globalists, they have high-tech filtration systems in their home. They know what's being sprayed 
so they know what the antidote can be. I mean, they know exactly what's being sprayed. So I'm sure they have some sort of homeopathic that they've developed because they know the exact chemical concoctions of what's being put in the air. So that's one thing that I want to get a grasp on through hair samples and taking my own health into my own hands yeah. is come up with a homeopathic remedy for people uh, as a preventive to all of this nanoparticulate poisoning. But ultimately, you know, it's like I have a health portion on my website, actualactivist.com. It talks about chelation yeah. and chelating. Um, it's spelled with a C-H. C-H-E-L-A-T is to chelate. Um, L-A-T-E. Uh, C-H-E-L-A-T-E for people who are new to it. And you can figure out all these different ways. People are different because they have been exposed to different things. You know, if you've got too much titanium or mercury in your system, there's going to be better ways to chelate. But ultimately, there's these different plants that can really help pull the stuff out of your body, such as moringa, spirulina, zeolite. Um, people are using a cilantro. There was the study of this prison population. They're studying their urine, and all of these heavy metals were turning up, and ultimately they discovered that these prisoners were eating a bunch of cilantro. The cilantro will pull heavy metals out of your body, and that'll prevent it from getting to your brain, because really they just want to get a lot, enough metals in our brain that we become these antennas for, to interact with these frequencies even more so. And as we're getting these implants in our brains and our eyes and our wrists and all these other different implants that we're going to be convinced through this globalist agenda that has us wanting to go to Mars and all this other stuff and become part robot. The more robotic we become and the more nanoparticulate metals that we get sprayed with and injected with, the more we're going to resonate with these nefarious frequencies that are just looking to have full spectrum dominance of all the inhabitants on planet Earth. Holy shit. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense, unfortunately. Pow, pow. <laughs> <laughs> So, eat so, cilantro. What else can we do? Um, well, it's I'm not really a big important. cilantro fan. I don't either. like it either, but Black. there's all that other stuff, like spirulina well, and you know chlorella. What, and... Yeah. what about, like, is there a certain type of cheeseburger? <laughs> chips? <laughs> what, what kind of chips will get me out of this? <laughs> or what strain of weed? Well, actually, different strains of marijuana will open up different neural pathways, and they'll actually kill cells in your lungs, which get replenished with new cells. So those cells that have been bombarded with all of the shit that we're breathing, breathing in, they're actually being killed when you smoke and es export it out. There's a study out of Stanford that showed that people smoking cigarettes and marijuana, that these half-dead cells that the tobacco were not killing properly and cancer was thriving in these half-dead cells, that the smoking of marijuana was actually killing those cells and escorting them out of the body so the cancer couldn't form. So we was actually curing people of cancer. But ultimately, our bodies are so mineral deficient that we are absorbing these nanoparticulate heavy metals such as strontium into our bones because we're hope our bodies are thinking, hopefully, that this is a beneficial thing that we're absorbing because we're so deplenished in calcium, magnesium, and all these things. And so the first thing that's most important is to get your health in check and to get your mineral saturation on point, okay? People need to really take into consideration that magnesium is something we don't come by as often as we should. And for every molecule of sugar that you intake, it takes 54 molecules of magnesium to process that sugar. So just about everybody listening is deficient in magnesium. Okay, so first and foremost, you yep. have to take that into consideration. You can take an Epsom salt bath. You can take magnesium supplements and sprays and all this stuff to get it all dialed in. But even more important are all of these different minerals that are no longer in our foods, that are no longer in our soils, that historically our ancestors came in contact with all of these noble elements and these monotomic um, plant uptake in ready to be soluble in our bodies, all of these different minerals and metals, such as palladium, gold, silver, boron, all these things, but they're not in the soil anymore. Everything's been deplenished. And so our bodies really need these things. And if, if you can, there's a company, Magic Minerals, that I've just been put in contact with that has 70 different minerals that have been uptaken by plant, and so they're ready to be, 
They're ready to be ingestible by human. And you take these for a couple of days and you're feeling like a million bucks because your body has never had these monatomic elements that you're supposed to be having. And once you get up to speed on your minerals and you're completely mineral saturated, then when you're getting sprayed with barium and strontium and cadmium, your body doesn't even want to uptake it, mm. hopeful that it's calcium, whatever it, you know what I mean? So that's really the best way to get your health in your own hands and also to get alkaline and to know the difference between acidic foods and alkaline and to get your alkalinity of your body in check. What was that uh, place again you called or that, that um, business you, you said? Uh, Magic Minerals. Magic Minerals. So... So yeah. um, let's M &M. Ta let's talk about your your film a little bit more. Plug get plug that before we run out of time. Your Frankens guys. I mean, we've sort of touched on a lot of stuff. You're going to be coming out within your sequel, but for people, um, I didn't have time to watch it. I was going to watch it before it came out. I went searching for you before it even came out, and then we ended up <clears throat> doing this uh, pretty quick after we got in touch. So, but uh, can you tell people what what's different about yours compared to some of these other typical um, kind of chemtrail or geoengineering films? Of course. So the beginning of the film walks you through the chronology of the timeline of how we got to where we are and to even get you to a point that you can fathom how how we got to this level. Okay, it shows um, with an artistic kind of uh, take on it because I'm putting the stock footage in these um, TVs from the era. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the 60s, we're showing clips from Woodstock and from Vietnam and showing the weather warfare, how it even got there. But even there's footage from the 40s and 50s that show the weather manipulation and the agenda at play before they took it black ops and top secret where it's at now. So ultimately, the very beginning of the film walks you through the chronology, the timeline, and then we get to modern day where we have these solar geoengineering proponents such as David Keek pushing their agenda on all these different talk shows. And through the global controlled media, which has now been consolidated down to six companies that all are in with one another and they're all owned by the same families. And so now there's really no trusted news source and all the different news agencies are just handed a script. And so that's, that's uh, touched upon the, the, um, the distrust that the media has exposed itself to becoming. And we, we, we show the bad guys in the film and then it breaks away from that and shows the good guys and how we've actually had, do have these activists that are, that are reaching out and speaking out and trying to raise people's awareness to getting them to look up and, and recognize that there's actually something going on in the sky. So I was lucky enough to interview former prime minister of British Columbia, Canada, uh, Bill Vanderzam. Bill Vanderzam was a hero to a lot of Canadians because he was able to, while in office, roll back this HST tax federal government was imposing a tax, a sales tax on all of the province of British Columbia. And the, his constituents didn't want it. And he fought the federal government and he got the tax removed. And so a lot of people reached out to him thinking that, you know, maybe he had some answers and some honesty because he was a, a loyal, trustworthy, courageous politician. They thought maybe he'd have some answers for what was going on in their sky. And he hadn't even heard of it. And he listened to his constituents and looked up, and he and his wife completely woke up to it. And he started doing his own research, and he reached out to all of the contacts he had in his Rolodex and wow. reached out finally to Ottawa. He reached out to Ottawa, finally, which is Canada's Washington, D.C. And he spoke to the federal-level government and kept on digging. And finally... They responded, and I, re I interviewed him about this in the film, and what he said, and he showed me the document, was they responded with a, yes, there's an ongoing geoengineering oh, program, and it's um, under the guise of research, and furthermore, and it's, black, it's completely blacked out. Like, they sent them a 20-page document. Yeah. And 90% of it is, is completely blacked out. But it did admit that there's an ongoing geoengineering program and basically told them to shut up. You know, I was like, look, this is the, all the information we're going to give you and you're not going to get anywhere with it. So here you go. So he um, it was very outspoken against it and had stacks of letters from people all over his country, um, not even just British, British Columbia. 
And so he was very willing to be interviewed. I went out to his estate in Ladner, British Columbia, and that was the first uh, big interview that I was able to land for the film. Good for you. From there, from there, I uh, flew out um, some activists from Europe for the second global or for the first global chemtrail summit, and had them in the studio or this, you know, makeshift studio um, in. Northern California, and I interviewed those gentlemen. Uh, Terry Lawton, who is a very passionate activist out of Ireland, he had been really vocal about fluoride, and there was a there's literally a line of cancer and no cancer where people were fluoridated and not in the county that he grew up in, County Wexford in Ireland. And Terry is just an amazing story because he's he's from a very very small village. In the middle, and for, for, as far as I'm concerned, it's the middle of nowhere in Ireland. I mean, he's from this beautiful, um, very rural community where the closest village to him is like an hour away, and it's like 75 people, right? And he just had this passion, you know. And he he woke up to chemtrails, and he was he was just devastated by the fact that they would be doing something so messed up. And he got really loud and vocal. And I mean, and this is a guy with very little resources, very little, like he's in the middle of Ireland and he got loud enough for me to hear his voice and loud enough to come over to the Kim trail conference. And he's in the film, interviewed him. He just recently launched a website, climatechangeagenda.com that reveals that exposes the actual climate change agenda, the truth behind it all. And so that was a really valuable interview in the film. I also interviewed Patrick Roddy, another activist out of San Francisco, who has a website, StopSprayingUs.com, where you can access um, where to send your rainwater to get a rainwater analysis. Uh-huh. And he, he actually spoke and testified to the, the, at an EPA hearing in Washington, D.C. on jet fuel emission a couple summers ago, which you can find online. Um, it was actually a really passionate um, uh, testimony that he gave to the EPA. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely worth watching. So Patrick Roddy was in there. Scott Stevens, a former meteorologist weatherman out of Colorado. He was interviewed in the film. There's clips from Rosalind Peterson, a U.S. Department of Agriculture um, employee who spoke out against chemtrails at the U.N. There's also whistleblower Kristen Megan Edwards, who's really passionate about it. She was an ex-U.S. Air Force um, employee. She's outspoken about it. And in the film, I didn't get to interview her personally, but a clip of her is in there. Also, Ted Gunderson, former FBI chief of Los Angeles and a couple other cities. He was very outspoken about Kim Jones until he mysteriously died. Um, Clips of him are in the film. I also interviewed Harry Rhodes out of the United Kingdom. He came out for this summit as well, and we interviewed him. He's really into the Tesla technology and the frequency of it all. And he touches upon that. So that's really a critical piece of the film. Um, I interviewed um, this Native American from the Ajumawe tribe of Mount Shasta, California, who woke up to it and has this passionate, heartfelt, what the heck is going on with our skies? How come nobody's ever seen this kind of thing? Um, I got, I got a nice, array of interviews from people who are totally awake to it and care and are actively speaking out against it, you know, and those are the good guys. And the, the film ends with some uh, protests uh, all over the world. There's protests in San Diego, there's protests in Italy, in Germany, in Australia, in New Zealand. And there's some clips of me speaking on the Ground Zero radio with Clyde Lewis. I uh, filmed an interview where me and Patrick Roddy uh, were speaking about the chemtrail agenda, and there's some clips of me from um, different uh, speeches that I've given on on it all. But ultimately, the film ends with, uh, pardon me, with a passionate, um, empowering, inspiring, you know, get off your ass kind of ending that people really need. And the truth ultimately is is it's right there in front of your face, you know. And the truth eventually it'll piss you off, but it'll set you free. Inevitably, it'll set you free. So people that are just waking up to it, you know, there needs to be some sort of, like, telephone hotline people can call when they're waking up to the truth because it is a big kick in the face. But ultimately, it'll empower you to to 
you resonate on a frequency of truth, that'll open up all these other doors for you, you know? So, so yeah, it's, it's a really good thing. If you, everyone that breathes air that lives on this planet needs to, needs to watch that movie and look out for the, the next version of it. I'm going to slim it down to 60 minutes and get it translated into multiple languages and keep pushing it around. And, and I'm going to take it on tour across the United States in the spring. And I'll be filming the sequel, which which is going to keep going with the agenda and talk about the frequency manipulation and all the deeper, darker aspects of it all. That sounds so, yeah, great. It sounds really website. good, yeah. And then there's my website, Actual Activists, plural, with an S in actualactivists.com. And there I look forward to turning it into a social media platform where people can actually not be censored, like the brutal censorship we're seeing on social media nowadays, oh, yeah. especially myself. I got... Once I got to 23,000 followers on Facebook and I was speaking truth about fluoride vaccines, GMO, and chemtrails, my Facebook literally got turned off and all of my posts were showing up blank until finally now just just like a handful of posts will show up blank. But my, my scope of reach has been completely shut off. Instead of my posts seeing the 23,000 followers, they see like a couple hundred people. I mean, it's, it's, it's night and day. And this, hap- this all started happening in April, just before the second annual Global Chemtrail Summit that I hosted. But it's all good. I'll just roll with the punches and get more personal and talk to people face-to-face and look some people in the eyes and take this, con- this tour across the country because that's what it really needs is people need to meet people in person that are as passionate as I am, that care enough to devote their life to something and to make a movie about it and to keep plugging along. Yeah, that sounds so also- great. Like, it sounds great, and I totally agree with you. Go ahead. No, I was going to say that the film is a tool and it's a resource for people to share around to empower other people to be able to do the same, to share it around because, you know, not everybody can be as well researched as myself or other geoengineering activists, but you can share the movie, share the website and get that truth out there because we have to reach a tipping point. I liken this whole movement to the GMO movement. There was a point when nobody knew about GMO food. Nobody knew about Monsanto. Nobody knew any of that stuff, but there were activists that got loud enough. They got really vocal. They got loud. They risked their lives. Some of them actually lost their lives behind the scenes. Okay? Monsanto actually did off some people, and there is a a, a complete disinformation, misinformation, propaganda machine that tries to convince people that organic is not good and that GMO is whatever good. But ultimately, we go in the grocery store now, and the food is labeled, okay? There's, there's enough research out there that we can make an informed decision if we're willing to look at the facts, okay? And that took people getting loud, and that took a tipping point to be reached. A critical mass had to be reached for it to get as popular as um, in the public eye that now people know when you say Franken food. People are like, yeah, GMO, I totally stay away from the Dirty Dozen because of those thin skin and the, and the glyphosate and all that stuff, right? Like, people are educated enough to now know that there's GMO potatoes and, and tomatoes and all this stuff, right? Yeah, I, I agree with people you. Got, but I, I agree with you. Loud. So, ultimately, we have to reach a tipping point with the chemtrails. We have to get loud enough. We have to tell our friends and family and our peers and not be afraid of what our peers think because that is – one of the biggest roadblocks that will hit because people are afraid of what their peers peers are going to think and say about them. Nobody wants to be ostracized. Everybody wants to get along. But ultimately, if you share the truth with the right people, the wrong people will will eventually even come around because the truth is it's all encompassing. It's empowering. And it's a bond that we all share. You know, we have to get it around and it's up to us. It's our duty to the, the outcome of the planet and the children and all of the life that surrounds us. It's our duty of care because we have this information. We have to share it with the public. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I think the difference between this, this battle and the GMO battle, I mean, that's a great example, but I think the difference is, uh, like you said, the social media lockdown. I mean, really they are ratcheting up the, their side of the fight as well. But I mean, there is so much evidence to show that this is going on. So I think it, this is one of the things that people will wake up to. I mean, people wake up in different, different levels and different, uh, you know, sometimes it takes a while. And I think that this is the type of movie that'll get people to, 
just to look a little deeper or just to even, you know, just to even realize like maybe it's just the seed that needs to be planted so people can start, start waking up to it. Cause it's really, I think it's one of the most critical problems that's going on right now. Well, I think it's, it is. And especially because the media is normalizing it and pushing it now as the solution yeah, yeah. to global to global warming. If if you all know about the Hegelian dialectic, and I know you do, this yeah. problem reaction solution. Yeah. Well, the global warming hoax is the problem. The reaction is fear, and the solution is to block out your sun with nanoparticulate aluminum. Okay, that's not the solution. That's another problem. And then once that problem is once the problem, once they spray aluminum and they see the side effects, then they're just going to have another problem that we react to and they have another solution for us, which is further bullshit. You know, it's like they're walking us down this path where we'll have no choice at the end because the only solution will be theirs. Well, well the problem is if they run out of those solutions, you know, that's when they're just going to, you know, it's going to go from from free to pain real fast. <laughs> like, okay, we're, we can't fuck around anymore we're just gonna do it with by the you know the barrel of a gun now exactly yeah and i mean the other the other multifaceted part of this is the blocking out of the sun i mean we're finding out i think there's a lot of scientific research now showing how healthy the the sun is i've seen the sun get bucked by the moon is fucking amazing we should do that shit every day (laughs) once a day oh boy just for a minute so, so what about your safety, Matt? I mean, you're you're digging into this pretty hard for the last few years. You're causing lots of waves. You're probably uh, on the radar. Have you experienced any anything like that? Any resistance? Any threats? Any uh, strange occurrences? Like, are you worried about that? I'm not scared. No, I can't be. I mean, this is this is the most important thing for humanity right now. And if you know, if heaven forbid something happened to me, I hope that I've caused enough stir that someone else will follow in my footsteps. You know what I'm saying? I, it's an honor and a privilege to have had enough traction right now to even be going on shows and to be able to, to reach a broad audience with this truth. Um, there's no stopping me. And so, and so would you suggest that people do get out there and, and protest? Like you, you show at the end of your movie, all these different protests and stuff like that. So people can go to your website, they can check out, you know, the events, you have the summit coming up in spring, but is there any other things you can suggest people to do on their own? Um, I'll happily share my PowerPoint with people and they can present it. Well, oh, that's um, a good idea. I'll happily, I'll happily send people a copy of my DVD or they can just order one on my GoFundMe com slash frankenskies um, and you can screen the DVD yourself. I mean, yeah, I, I, I would love for everybody, let me rephrase that, anybody who is able to process this information and realize that it's true, they need to convey the message as loud as they possibly can so that we can alter the course of humanity and actually save this planet. Otherwise, we're going to be going into a freaking ice age or something because these nefarious globalists have an agenda at mind that is very dark and very bad. So, hey, maybe we can do that. If you send me a PowerPoint, like, well, I'll, I'll spend some time and do like a video podcast on, you know, and get it under our platform, too. And I'll just talk about about your PowerPoint. I'll go through it and we'll put it out there. And, you know, I mean, we'll give you all the or credit, could, but that could be something can we can do, do here. For us. You know, on the show another day if you want. You know, come on, yeah, present, present it yourself. Yeah, because we do have, we just recently sort of got enough proper capability to do a good, uh, you know, good, good looking video on on YouTube or whatever. So we could also have you back on to go through that in uh, in detail as well. I'd be happy to share it with anybody who wants it, and I'd be happy to give the presentation on any platform. Um, anywhere, everywhere. When I go on this tour across the country, I'll be giving the presentation and then screening the movie Ooh. and then having a, a little panel discussion afterwards and whatnot. So that'll be pretty impactful. I plan on hitting a lot of universities, a lot of small towns, yeah, yeah. And, um, and waking some people up because that's what we need right now. Are you coming by Calgary at all? Or? Um, I, I'd like to get up to Canada too. I just got some wheels. Finally, I've been without a car for a year. So, uh, I, that is part of my plan. Yes. Right on. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like keep in touch for sure. And we'll, we'll help you out with that kind of thing. And, uh, 
we'll be there to bring some people along with us. Beautiful. Yeah, we definitely need to just get the ball rolling and to have a, a massive um, chain reaction where where everybody starts waking up to, to these truths because ultimately they want to hide the truth from us. And after you get down this, this who, what, why, where, when, and you ask yourself, why are we being attacked on all of these different levels? Why is our language being manipulated? Why is this birth certificate putting us into slavery at birth? Why is our food being poisoned, our water being poisoned? Why is there an attack on all of the children that are being born on this planet? It ultimately, the, the final answer is that they don't want us to have our true power. That once we come together and realize the truth, we're unstoppable, and that's what they fear. So we got to get there. Right on. I think uh, I think there's something. Have you been looking into these fires at all in Cal- Cali as well with uh, some sort of manipulation tool? Is that uh, I keep getting these emails and I haven't had time to look into it. But is that something that uh, is on your radar? Oh yeah, yeah. That's really um, that's really sad that that's going on. But it, it seems to be a directed energy weapon um, that was used. Uh, the drones are equipped with directed energy oh. weapons. It looked like that they totally uh, that they totally attacked the whole area. I mean, um, the footage that I'm seeing and the coverage that I'm seeing and the laser beams that I'm seeing coming down from the sky from the helicopter footage and all these other dots that I'm connecting, it's, it's pretty obvious that the New World Order, order out of chaos, um, that we're there. I mean, like, we went from, I don't even want to talk about the thing that happened in Nevada last time I even mentioned it, the show got cut off. Um, So there was that, and then there was those hurricanes, and now we've got these fires, and they all seem to be um, purposefully um, manipulated. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the citizens are being targeted. We're at war. This is World War Three, and nobody even knows. Yeah, exactly. I mean, who knows? It could be glo- You know, it could be a global power struggle, and we're the fucking uh, we're the damage. You know, we're the ones that get affected by it. So, so uh, we're going to link to all your stuff in the show notes. Is there anything else you want to mention before we uh, wrap this thing up? Um, please follow me on YouTube. I have a lot of different shows that I've done recently archived on there. Matt Landman on YouTube and then Matt Landman on Facebook and even on Twitter. Um, yeah, please reach out. And if, and if you have any information for me or you want to interact with me, you can email me frankenskies at gmail.com. And please look out for Frankenskies on Vimeo, Frankenskies on YouTube. Check out actualactivist.com, like I said. And yeah, um, I just really want to encourage people to be empowered to speak their truth. You know, there's this quote, speak your truth even if your voice shakes. And that's, that's exactly what it is. It's like, it doesn't matter what these people are going to think of you. If it's, if it's truth, then go for it. You know, be the change you want to see in the world. And don't, don't be a coward, you know, like be brave. And you, you'll, never, you'll never even believe the amazing things that can come out of waking people up and bringing this light into the world that it so desperately needs. Sweet. Darren's got that quote right above his monitor. I think that's the first time I've actually seen it as well. So that's well said. Right on, buddy. Well, thanks so much for the work you do. And I, I think it's really important. And uh, let's keep in touch and we can have you back on. And we'll, we'll, link, we'll link to all that stuff. We'll send everybody your way and, and keep up the, uh, the research. Thank you, and thanks for watching the movie, and let me know what you think. All right, buddy. Okay, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. And that was our chat with the one and only Matt Landman. Hmm. That I went by fast. That was like your wet dream. No, that went by fast. It was good, but I liked the yeah, history, you know, it getting into the history good. and all that. Yeah, it was pretty, you know, I I had, I pictured myself having all these more detailed questions about the science of it and all that, but I mean, it, it and maybe it's because I'm too familiar with the topic and maybe we should have dumbed it down you for everybody what, a little bit, but what? Canada's Larry King didn't have a... No, no, no. But I just mean like we, I just felt like we didn't need to get into that level. Like there's so much obvious evidence that's popping up everywhere. Like you don't even need to. Well, to plus get Matt that. does a great job of just, you know, he He's basically filled that all. time with just laying it out. You know, yeah. you don't really need to ask much. You can, you can just that's let him go true, for 10 yeah. minutes at a time. And, yeah. You know, it always turns out better that way. And we just shut the fuck up. Get out of the way. Sure get out of the way and let <laughs> it happen. <laughs> just steer the cart a yeah. little bit here little and there. <laughs> It gets too crazy. Yeah.
A big so, thanks yeah. to Matt for coming on the show. Check hope out to his see website. a live. Hope to see a live uh, event from him in Calgary. That'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe we'll have him back on again, do video. So check out his website, guys. Check out his movie, Franken Skies. Check that shit out. Thanks, Matt. Uh, of course, check out GreatAmerica.ca slash support if you can, guys. Uh, and support us if you can. Find it in your heart. If you find a little value from our show, uh, go on there and give us, send a little value back our way. Uh, if you can sign up for a monthly, that really is does help the best. It's uh, easier to track, but if you can't do that, uh, one-time donations are fantastic too. And uh, there's a bunch. If you do that, of course, you're going to get access to the Black Budget support feed. I just released an episode in there yesterday. Oh, yeah, that was a great episode. And I'm going to release another one this weekend. So, and I think now with our new format of doing double interviews most of the time, it's going to be a lot easier to start squeezing that black budget content and we're gonna And we're going to put extra content as well out in the normal feed. I mean, it's like, you know, we're just, we just wanted a a little bit of a solution to help people that that support us, right? That's right. So check it out, guys. Grammarica.ca slash support. You know what else we should be pushing? Reviews. Yeah, check I'm, out, uh, review the show if you can, guys. Check out iTunes. There's a link in the show notes. I don't know if there's any place else to review the show but iTunes. There's Stitcher, I guess. I don't know about any place but that. But if you find some place you can review it, review it. And share it everywhere. Because no one else does. And uh, we don't. And we don't have no marketing. We can't afford any marketing. We don't have enough support. So you guys just market for us and we'll uh, cut out the middleman. Yeah, that's the best way. Yeah, and it's free. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.
black budget stream. Merrily, 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 nothing in life is free. Row, row, row your boat, cry America, black budget stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Row, row your boat, cry America, black budget stream. Street.